Good morning. Good morning. Well, St. Luke's, here we are. We're on the brink, at the edge, straddling the border between Advent and Christmas, between preparation and arrival. The liturgical calendar creates this tension for us today, placing the fourth Sunday of Advent on the same day as Christmas Eve. The labor of our collective anticipation and waiting is quite literally at this very moment almost over. In birthing terms, this is the moment of transition, the heightened state of the just before, where what is coming is so imminently close, the only thing left to do is consent to its arrival. In both my children's births, transition, transition greeted me with fists clenched full of my spouse's clothes and a mouth overflowing with obscenity, which I admit I openly and unabashedly casted heavenward. <laughs> Whether chosen, imposed, or circumstantial, transition of all kinds requires hard work for transition breaks open our former lives, our former selves, and sometimes with it, our bodies also. All transition carries with it risk of real loss and the possibility of new life, both together and everything in between. Perhaps this is why transition often draws us heavenward with accusations of blame, grateful praise, or in my case, cursing. But the story before us this morning, as you know, is not the story of Jesus' birth. You can come back in a few hours to hear that one, and I hope you will. This morning, our work together rather focuses on the Annunciation and the life-altering transitions it induced for Mary just months before she found herself in the throes of childbirth. This story, Mary's story, born from her response to God's desire for intimacy and partnership with her, is very much worth our time and attention in the dawning rays of this Christmas season. The multiple transition Mary makes at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke are profound. In many ways, they set the stage for Luke's entire narrative. Along with other characters in the first chapter of Luke, like Elizabeth and Zechariah, Mary's identity goes through a series of shifts. She is a virgin, and then she is with child. She is afraid of God's word, and then boldly proclaims God's promises. She is a nobody and then is a somebody, the very mother of God. These and a host of other reversals early on in Luke's story foreshadow how the task of joining one's body to God's work of love in this world invites disciples to reorder the self and actively take part in the reordering of society. Luke's is a gospel full of transitions. Though Mary and others Luke writes about, through Mary and others Luke writes about, readers come to understand how God's reign made known to the world through the birth of Jesus would fulfill God's promises and bring upheaval, both together and everything in between. For in Jesus Christ, the God who is about to reorder the prevalent divisions between the powerful and the lowly, the hungry and those who were well fed, Mary testifies in her Magnificat that God's mercy would be made known, especially to the drown downtrodden, who would be lifted up, and the poor, who would be fed with good things. This is Luke's good news. Change is a coming. Though sparse on the details in our story today, Luke is still careful to give attention to the difficulty of all these transitions for Mary. When Gabriel greeted her 
named her as favored and declared the Lord is with you, Luke indicates that Mary was very perplexed. Confused, she pondered what sort of greeting she had received. Another translation of the same verse reads, but she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what kind of greeting this might be. And interestingly, Mary is disturbed before receiving the content of Gabriel's message. The mere arrival of the angel and his proclamation of God's favor was itself confounding. Indeed, Mary's first response to God's grace and presence with her was bewilderment and uncertainty, and we can muse about why she might have been afraid. We might consider her young age and the cultural context, or we might think of other faithful servants like Abraham and Moses who were also disturbed by the presence of God. Perhaps she, like they, knew that proximity with the Holy One is often accompanied by an invitation to shared work and partnership. Even before she knew how her life was about to change, she knew change was a common. The arrival of God's messenger plunged her into a more uncertain future. And here, at the cusp of manifold change, at the brink of a number of transitions and before a future she could not even foresee, God, through God's messenger, meets her with such tenderness. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Notice the verb Gabriel uses is passive. Mary receives favor. The grace God bestows upon her is not merited, but gift given. When the angel continues, telling Mary of the work to which she is being called, Mary has more questions, of course. Don't we all? But Gabriel explains that the Holy Spirit will come upon her, that the power of the Most High will overshadow her, and through all this, all that is about to happen, she, like her formerly barren relative Elizabeth, would know, Matthew Brown, that there is nothing impossible for God. At this point in Mary's story, Gabriel dramatically breaks open the idea that a future lived with God is never closed or fixed, though Luke assures his readers that God's reign in Christ will never end. He is also clear that it will be perpetually uncertain. While there is indeed a future which is predictable, programmed, scheduled, and foreseeable, Mary's story invites us to ponder what it might mean to embrace a future coming that cannot be planned for because it cannot be foreseen. Like Mary's, this future is one that can only be greeted, like the dawn, with the impossible and unmerited grace that comes upon its arrival. And beautifully, but strangely, this is what Mary does, isn't it? Upon hearing the call of God to a more uncertain future, she takes up the refrain of Hannah and Samuel, of Deborah, Ruth, and Isaiah. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word, she says. Yes, she says, like the psalmist today who is persuaded that God's love is established forever. Mary puts her faith in the faithfulness of this God who has set firmly in the heavens a faithfulness that is constantly, ever dawning. Mary's response to the unexpected messenger from God and his unexpected news and her willingness to embrace the related transitions this news precipitated has enshrined Mary in history as a model of Christian virtue and an exemplar of the Christian faith. Reciprocating God's own tenderness to her, Mary ultimately joins God in offering the tender gift of a baby 
to all the world. To truly conceive the tenderness of God towards us in the moments just before Christmas conditions us all as it does Mary to offer the tenderness of our own lives to the first rays of the future God is always tending. But it is hard work to tread the dawn. As we tarry in the lingering moments of Advent, witnessing how Mary reciprocates the tenderness of God by holding ever so tenderly the bewilderment of gift, the dangerous threat of transition, and the overwhelming presence of holy God. I wonder what it might mean to consider how the tenderness of God might be greeting you on the cusp of Christmas. How might the heightened state of transition help you receive the hope and provision of God's companionship in your work to enflesh God's reign? I do not know the nature of all that might be causing you to praise or curse or mourn this season. I do not know the nature of the transitions shadowing the contours of your life. But I ask that you might consider to cling to Mary's story, knowing deep in your bones that God promises overshadow All this, the God of the holy night, greets you from the future with tenderness, perpetually growing the tendrils of sufficient grace so that your soul might magnify the Lord, knowing in every dawning moment how much it is worth. Amen.